wicked problem is characterized not by urgency, though there might, they might feel quite urgent. It's much more about uncertainty and complexity. So, um, you know, things around Brexit a few years ago and, and maybe, you know, currently as mm -hmm. well, um, feel really complex and uncertain. There's an urgency to it. How are we going to work out how we keep going forward? You know, whatever. Um, you know, COVID is another one of these kinds of wicked challenges. Um, not wicked because it's it's bad, though mm -hmm. it's brought a lot of difficulty, but wicked because of its uncertainty and complexity. Um, and if you have a leader who steps out and says, I've got a quick answer or I've got a process that's been tried and tested a thousand times before, it falls flat because... Well, no one's been here before. No one's done sort of Brexit before. No one's done. I mean, we've had other issues globally, kind of like COVID, but not quite on the scale. So it's it's it feels in disingenuous to say an answer or a process. Um, what Grint and his team found was whenever we have these kinds of wicked problems, we need to lead with questions. Hello and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs, and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started, and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised, and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top, you're in the right place here on Anatomy of a Leader. Like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will change the way you think and may even change your life. Brennan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming here and, you know, wonderful to have you sitting across the table, mm. finally. Um, you're a philosopher specializing in trust and have set up your own business philosophy at work, which is a consultancy helping companies think their best. Right. So, yeah, if you can give an introduction to what your business is to our mm. audience and what exactly you mean by thinking their best. Yeah, great question. So Philosophy at Work exists to help businesses think their best, as you say. We're a collection of philosophers, uh, business psychologists, academics, authors, variety of thinkers that are coming together to say, how do we understand how the brain works, um, how we can reflect really well so that, as you say, we can do our best thinking because we know that uh, the quality of your thinking, your mindset, uh, how well you can process information and connect the dots sort of at pace in between back-to-back -back meetings or whatever it might be really makes a difference for the quality of our outputs. Um, how we think, I mean, if you, you could say that your thinking is the very interface that we have with the world, you know, information comes in through our senses and then we do stuff with it. And that's our, that's our thinking that is maybe uh, embodied, there's some physical elements to it, but also just that sort of the way that we tend to think about thinking, that sort of mindful processing. Um, how we do that and where we end up makes a big difference for the way that we interact with each other. So a lot of what we're doing with the businesses that we work with is how do you think well together with your colleagues, with your clients, so you can be a really great thinking partner to sort of draw out the, the great ideas that are going on there. Um, but we might also say, well, thinking really matters at the coal face because of the way you make decisions. So a lot of the sort of thinking work we do around, you know, being curious so we can ask questions, doing critical thinking, uh, creative thinking, um, even self-awareness and, and trust, some of the different things that we might come on to. All of that comes together so that we can think our best. And um, to come back to your question of what does that even mean? I think um, I'll go back to uh, a philosopher that I heard talk about thinking as just doing stuff with information. Mm -hmm. And so I love it because it's simple. It's sort of um, on the ground. It's, there's no big words. And if thinking is doing things with, with knowledge, with, with information, then thinking well is doing things with knowledge, processing everything in our heads and everything in our, that makes up our work, doing that in such a way where we're not missing the really important bits, where we're aware of our own assumptions where we're switched on to how the way we're thinking and seeing and doing things, how that impacts other people. So I'd say um, thinking well 
is um, processing information in ways which you know has a good outcome, which uh, is driven by good motivation, which has a good impact on our own well-being and the well-being of others. So I'm packing a lot into it, but that's part of the reason that you know helping businesses think their best is a, it's a pretty broad term because I think it enables us to do a lot of really important things. Mm. That's a lot to include in that with regards mm. to thinking because you know we almost take that for granted, don't we? Like, but we just, well, we, we think about things before we do them, but actually there's mm. a lot more that goes into that. Mm, mm. Do you think leaders today do enough of that? Do enough thinking. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, I think there's enough thinking, but probably not always the quality of thinking mm. that we want. Whenever I, I work with leaders, uh, particularly if we're talking about sort of people that are moving up into what's generally thought of as leadership, leadership position, which I know there's a whole question there about what is leadership anyway, but a lot of that space where, where we come into contact with leaders is people who maybe have been leading for a while and are wanting to um, just sort of sharpen their skills or are coming into it that, a little bit more. Um, and what I keep hearing is I'm too busy to sort of think through this properly or there's too much pressure to think properly. So I think there's a lot of cognition going on. You know, we're sort of thinking all day long, but the quality, I don't think there's very much or enough or as much as we would like mm. quality thinking. I definitely identify with that mm. where you can get so busy with doing what you need to do that actually the execution becomes more important than the strategic thinking. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you're a small business owner where, mm. you know, there's, there's very limited resources or, you know, mm. you know, sometimes speed is really important, but actually you're having to wear two different hats. It's the thinking and the, the doing the execution. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to admit that, you know, doing both simultaneously is an absolute mm, challenge. I mm. definitely have to kind of like carve out time to yeah. do that. And it's only recently that started yeah. to actually have kind of those pockets of time where it right. feels like they're almost not productive to some extent. Yeah. Because yeah. you're sort of yeah. sitting there looking out the window, kind of pondering life in some ways. Yes. How can we how can we do that better? Yeah. Well, so this, so uh, something I wanted to come back to mm. and just hearing you speak, and I think maybe starts getting into how we do it better as well, is something that struck me probably about, I don't know, five years ago, was this, uh, the fact that thinking is so integrated. So on the one hand, I hear you saying, you know, it, it's, it's hard to do the thinking and the doing and because we're going back to back and maybe if we're, if we're sort of involved in the strategy and the delivery, it feels like a very, very full life indeed and it's hard to hard to build that in and implicit in that i think and this is this is how i tend to think about it as well but implicit in that view i think is that thinking is over here and doing is over here mm. and actually if we're going to be doing high quality thinking then we're going to have to somehow carve out um you know ideally a week to go do sort of uh, uh you know sort of lock ourselves in a cabin and just get you know like, a sharp pencil and mm -hmm. you know like or, bill gates style right right yeah yes, thinking exactly. weeks exactly mm -hmm. which you know uh, yeah, he's he's a, a a good example of someone that really benefits from those deep sort of uh, ring fenced times. But I don't think that's always what it has to be. Even if you say, "Oh, well, for me to do my best thinking, I'm going to have to carve out an hour or something, even at the start of the day, that's just for that." And and you know, there's so many leaders that will get up really early so that they can they can hit that. And and that's a practice that I do as well. And there's a lot of benefit to it. So taking the the sort of think week is good. Taking the think sort of hour is good. But actually, a lot of what I try to work with leaders on is finding ways to integrate their thinking with their doing mm -hmm. so that it's not just, oh, I wish I had, uh, you know, I've missed my hour of thinking in the morning or my week this this quarter or whatever. Um, oh, well, I guess I can't think again until another three months time. Um, instead to say, well, no, actually, I've got 30 seconds in between calls. Um, there's a lot bouncing around in my mind. I'm just going to, while I boil the kettle, make a cup of tea or whatever, or even, you know, 30 seconds is probably enough time for that. I'm just going to close my eyes and try to switch off some of the stimulus because there's so much going on mm -hmm. and, um, and just sit here and sort of let my brain catch up with myself. Mm. Um, so a lot of times we're finding sort of micro adjustments and different ways of processing so that if in a conversation, you would normally just have the conversation and go, okay, well, how are we going to execute? Instead, we can just find a slightly better approach and say, okay, well, let's have the conversation, but let's 
map out our thinking and try to deconstruct it and break it down so that we can pinpoint really where we need to invest our energy. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm saying is if thinking is doing things with, with information, then kind of we're thinking all day long because we're doing stuff all the time, but we can do that in a, in a more helpful way or a less sort of effective way. Mm. And so, um, to help us think better, it's just finding some of these methods, some of the techniques, um, practicing our awareness as well. So, um, my background is in philosophy and a lot of what we do with philosophy at work is deconstruct the history of philosophy to say, okay, well, when, you know, when Socrates or Simone Beauvoir or someone said the thing they said, um, we could quote that, but more interestingly, what were they doing there and how do we tease that out mm-hmm. and then bring that in into a meeting? So, mm. so I think there's ways that we can, we can start to do it by raising our awareness about, uh, you know, how am I feeling right now? What's going on in my head? Mm-hmm. Um, so I can be a, that little bit faster at spotting the the, the assumptions, mm-hmm. um, looking for opportunities to ask a great question. There's two things that I picked up on, which is this mm-hmm. idea of information being bombarded at us. Yeah. And especially yeah. as you know, we're getting into the age with lots of technology, you know, social media, like in, in, everything is instant. So we're just constantly bombarded yeah. with information yeah. and our brains really still can't be able to take all of that in and process that. Mm. And I think quite often, I know that I do this, like we forget to use what's already inside rather mm. than be just c- continuously reacting to whatever is going on outside. And yeah. I think the idea of thinking your best to me and from, you know, based on what you're saying is this idea of like this pause and saying, well, I already have this information, you know, I already have what I need, yeah. uh, or maybe I don't, but I need to sort of stop, reassess, use my brain mm. and then saying, okay, I can do this with this information or yeah. I need to seek this out and make, uh, you know, make decisions based on that. Yeah. And the other point is mm. about awareness and sort of you know this reflection mm-hmm. one of the other guests that i had on the show um uh nikolai chen nielsen who mm. who's co-written a book about um return on ambition mm, okay. and their one of the main key points was about self-reflection and mm. those who spend more time on self-reflection mm. are much more um likely to be making better decisions when it comes to yeah. their own careers and how they use their career to kind of you know yeah. get to what their ambitions are Mm -hmm. and this idea of yeah reflection and thought like you know deliberate thought is really really important yeah and that that's where um i think that's really interesting that space of deliberate thought Mm -hmm. because that's clearly there's got to be something to that you know um but the reason it's really interesting to me is to say well how do we do that so if you if you say to me um there's evidence that suggests that carving out some time to do deliberate thought is really important for us as leaders. Uh, that sounds right to me, at least, you know, so I go, great. Uh, so I'm going to get a nice coffee, sharp pencil, fresh journal, go, right, I'm going to deliberately think now. Um, and I think a lot of us feel like, great, what do I, how do I do, how do I do that? What do yeah. I do now? Right. Yeah. And particularly also, you know, it, it's a really common view, but the further we rise up through the ranks, it sort of it sort of is really lonely at the top, and there's um, there's more pressure on us to feel like well we have to have the answers. There's this obligation to know, and so now if I'm if I'm a leader sitting in a C-suite and I need to think deliberately about this and do strategy, I feel like people are looking to me for the answer. How do I do that? And so really, where I'm trying to work with the collaborators I bring in, different philosophers and things, is to say, how do we do that deliberate thinking? Um, and and sometimes it's it we zoom in and we focus on things and sometimes we zoom out so going back to something you said a couple minutes ago um unfocusing and sort of l- allowing our brains to 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 loosen up in a way is really important you know there's something to th- there's a reason that so many people say oh i had a great idea in the bathtub you know or <laughs> yeah. what are you going for a run or something mm-hmm. you know and um there's a there's an author in canada named chris bailey who who wrote this great book uh, i think it's called hyper focus and um and he talks a lot about the the value of boredom mm-hmm. um, at a cognitive level because when we get to sort of boredom, there it does something that kind of helps all the rubber bands loosen up. And he has this great quote where he says, um, "Scattering your focus mm-hmm. supercharges our uh, dot connecting power of our brain." Right. Um, and so he did. You know, for his book, he did experiments like um, I think he sat on hold for. At, for 
Air Canada, you know, helpline for like two hours or something like that, just to try, he tried to find things that made him bored Mm -hmm. and then saw, well, what did that do for him when it came to his sort of creative thinking ability? And, uh, and the answer was it did a lot. Um, but again, going back to what I said before, not all of us would say, well, you know, I don't have time for me to sit on hold for two hours. I've got, you know, so, so what <laughs> watching paint dry. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that might be good, but you know, how do I build that in, in, in sort of micro adjustments? And that's where it's saying, well, let's look at how we ask questions. Let's look at, um, what assumptions are being had around, around the table when we're having a meeting? Um, how do we understand ourselves and going to your point, the self-reflection, self-awareness is, is really, really core. Um, the ability to, to understand where we're coming from, you know, the, the ancient Greek view to sort of know thyself being so, so central um, is really, I think, about saying, let me get better at noticing what's going on inside myself mm-hmm. and how I'm interfacing with that which is outside myself so that I can then be that little bit faster to sort of maybe stop myself from saying something that would have otherwise shut down the creativity in the room or, um, or maybe stop myself you know, to say something that will maybe start it so you know mm-hmm. if i'm if i for example just to make it really concrete um if we're you know leaders we feel pressure probably to have the right answer and maybe we have a discussion but then we feel like maybe it's our place to sort of come in and sort of rubber stamp the actual answer right um but if i'm more self-aware then i can feel the sort of temptation to have to have the last word and have the answer or something like that because i'm the leader um and if i notice that and i've processed that and i'm aware of where that's coming from in myself that it's not really the best thing for the team, but it's actually just coming from my sort of insecurity to uh, feel like I'm worth my pay or something, right? Mm. Um, then I'm that little bit faster to go, no, hang on, Brennan, you don't have to have the answer. You don't have to have the last word. It's actually really good for someone else to find the answer. Mm. And then I can stop myself. Um, and and that sends the message to others that actually, okay, this is really a collective. I think went from my experience when I look at bus- business leaders who or any leaders who are effective is this ability to recognize that you don't know everything yeah. and the fact that you have a team around the table is there for a reason you don't if you have all the answers what's the point mm, right mm, what's the point mm. of having a team yeah. and the ability to be able to give that sort of safe environment I'm talking a lot about psychological yeah. safety yeah. where yeah. other people are comfortable with bringing up Mm. ideas that maybe nobody even thought about which could not necessarily might not be the right idea for uh, Mm. that particular problem but it can spark off an idea in somebody else and how do you see from other people's perspectives to to kind of arrive at that to then arrive to a solution but you're right I mean self-awareness is is absolutely critical Mm. Mm. I mean what do you think Mm. makes a good leader Really good question. Um, so I guess where my brain initially goes is to think about what do we mean by what do we mean by, by good? Do we mean morally good, sort of virtuous? Do we mean effective? And um, and probably we mean kind of all of the above, mm. right? There, there's, well, what's your definition of yeah. good leader? Yeah. So I my definition of good leader is one which is able to be context sensitive. Um, and I hope that doesn't sound like a cop out. The reason I think it's it's context sensitivity is is sort of king when it comes to leadership is because that which is moral, um, that which is going to be effective when it comes to exec- executing, that which is going to be thoughtful to the other people around the table and everything, that's all about context. And um, and we could be, you know, the other things on the table other possible answers for what a, a good leader is, right? Could be uh, expert in their field, um, really sort of uh, someone that people just love. You know, they're really drawn to them. It's easy to bring people with them. Um, maybe they're they're really sort of servant-hearted or something. They're, they're great support people, right? Um, but you could be any of those things. But if you're not switched onto the context, then you could sort of misfire or, or, or use those strengths in a way which mm-hmm. doesn't really land well mm-hmm. with others. And so I think context sensitivity is, is really, really key. And, and, and actually, if you look at the history of 
of leadership thought, the sort of literature over the last 50 years or something. It's been a move from, um, you know, way back a couple hundred years ago, it was all about traits and you had to be like these sort of usually male kind of charismatic, right, right. you know, loud, you yeah. know, opinionated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To then saying, okay, well now, now it's, it's more about picking up sort of ways of being and then the, the more the most recent uh, mode of understanding leadership has been this this responsive context sensitivity and i think one of the reasons one of the places where we see that this is really important is um i mean if you take leadership in general you say well whenever we have an instance of leadership or context where leadership is relevant there's always uh three things at least there's always people so the leader and those people that are following them or not following them, um, which maybe makes them not a leader. But you have people, you have, people, you have uh, problems, we could say. So some type of, maybe that's too dark, opportunity, you know, challenge. There's some kind of uh, something happening that means we need leadership. And then in addition to the people problems, there's always a use of power as well. And that is the, the leader using the power that's given to them by those people that are looking to them to lead um, to address the, the the thing that's on the table at the moment and that's all about context i don't think it's possible to be a good leader um without being intimately connected to the people involved the the nature of the thing that you're all wrestling with and the power at your disposal mm -hmm. um so uh, maybe i you know i think if we were uh the sort of critic in my own mind is saying, well, Brennan, have you not really answered the question? Because, you know, you're kicking the can down the road a little bit because then, well, what does a good leader do in each of the situations? But I would say, I think I'm just probably being a little bit like Aristotle, whose, whose ethics was all about responding well in a given moment. And he, you know, he argued that you don't, there's no one right or wrong way to behave. It's not about, um, you know, being honest all the time, never telling a lie. It, those sort of rules which some other philosophers would sort of support. For him, it was all about being wise, which is context sensitive and saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm switched on to the sort of fine tuned things going on in the room. I understand that, you know, this member of my team is really tired today. So actually when they made that mistake, I'm not gonna respond to them in the same way as maybe if they'd made that mistake when they were fully sort of rested, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, I think good leaders are context sensitive they are pursuing wisdom, which is that responsiveness to the context mm. as well. And what skills do you think leaders need today? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I mean, again, because of probably my background and, and the kinds of things that I work on with people, um, I would say the kinds of thinking skills that I think are needed probably blend a little bit more broadly into broader skills, but I'll sort of focus on thinking skills. And those are things like self-awareness, something we already talked about because we don't even get started uh, understanding the context if we're not aware of um, ourselves and how we interact with others. Uh, building trust and psychological safety, I think is also really central. And, and I include that as a sort of thinking skill, because even though trust isn't exactly a thinking skill like critical thinking is, um, we know that we don't do our best thinking if we don't feel safe. And so I think a leader really needs to be able to support people in relationships so that they can feel that Oh, I can ask my questions. I can share what I think. So self-awareness, um, trust and psychological safety. I think critical thinking, that ability to, um, to be a, a supportive thinking partner. So critical thinking in the way where I'm, I'm saying critical with a, a small C. So, so not sort of <laughs> not criticizing. Uh, no, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Not, not, not being critical, uh, um, of others, mm -hmm. but knowing how to, and, and I, as a leader being, knowing how to bring others into that space as well and go, you know, what assumptions might we be having here? Um, where have we got too close to the thing? Can we take the v the value that we're all assuming or the thing that we're all thinking we should all do? Could we drop it into sort of an argument form? Or could we say, um, well, does the conclusion necessarily have to follow from the starting premises that we have? And knowing how to check that so that we can go into, you know, pitch to a room of investors or we can go in different places and say, do you know what? Not everyone has to like what we're doing, but we're confident that we've thought through it, prof uh, you know, um, um, well, well mm -hmm. enough so that we know what we're talking about. Um, so I think that that is really key. Curiosity is a skill. Um, I think it's also a trait, but I think it's, it's a skill that we can develop. That's really important decision making. Um, so these are the kinds of skills that I would say are really needed today. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, 
uh, yeah, there's there's more that I could say on that, but maybe we'll get to that as we go. <laughs> well, actually, talking about curiosity, yeah. because I mean, we talked about a lot about this topic. Mm -hmm. And asking questions, yeah. and particularly in a business context, can you expand on curiosity in business? Like, how does it play out? I mean, you talk about, you know, I think it's the five yeah. faces of curiosity mm. yeah. um, in your work, but how do these play out in business, um, particularly yeah. when it comes to leading people? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, the five faces of curiosity is something that we talk a lot about. And that's because sometimes, um, people in general, myself included, we tend to think about curiosity as something that's maybe not for everyone, right? So, um, you know, I have two young children, I know you do as well. Sometimes we think about um, curiosity as being for the young, right? Or maybe for the creative amongst us, those that are mm. particularly sort of creative roles, designers, whatever, strategists, of course, they need to be curious, but maybe not the rest of us. And actually, I think that's a real um, disservice if we get into that thinking trap, because as we know, with all the work that's been done around um, diversity of thought, which is just to say, you know, we hire f well for, for diversity, but then creating that kind of climate where everyone feels safe enough again to, to, to share their perspective, which is, you know, impacted by all their, their diverse experience in the room. So we need to have all those views coming in to really benefit from, from the great team we've brought around ourselves, but we're not going to get that if not everyone can own their own curiosity. And so we started talking about these five faces of curiosity because we wanted to show that it could come out in a lot of different ways. And so if, um, you know, we tend to think about curiosity as something like wonder, right? So, so wow, I'm really sort of um, in awe of the world and I get just sort of excited about all these different things. And if I'm doing that, someone might say, wow, you're a really curious person, you ask all these questions. Um, but then also some of our colleagues maybe are, um, really tenacious. They're, they're not so sort of in, in having wonder about, about things. They, they do things through a process driven way. They're really concerned that we get things right. And actually I would say that's, that can be them exercising their curiosity just as much as anyone else, because for them, the form of curiosity coming out there is saying, well, have we got this right? What might we need to get better? And that's curiosity, curiosity about how we can make it better. And so I want to help people to say, no, actually, all of us can be curious. All of us, you know, began life curious and, and, and it comes through. So, you know, a great exercise is to say, well, how did you love playing when you were five or something, right? Mm. Um, if you can remember that, or six or 10, um, that can be a really good sort of window into your own curiosity. But so, so to answer your question, it comes out in, you know, we talk about wonder, um, uh, tenacity, but also imagination. So the ability to go, well, I wonder how we could sort of move this forward and then work back an actual solution. Mm. Um, but also courage, first of all, it can take a lot of courage to ask your questions, but also I think courage can be a form of curiosity coming out. Also, if we say, well, do you know, I'm, uh, how could, gosh, we're, we have, we're wrestling with a really difficult, sort of issue that feels really difficult to talk about. Um, how can we move this forward? How can we take two things that feel really at odds? Um, you know, we, we disagree on a really important issue or whatever it might be. How can we move forward without either of us feeling like we've sort of lost our souls? Mm -hmm. um, and that takes courage. And I think that's also curiosity coming out. And the last sort of face of curiosity, the last way that it's uh, brought out is empathy. Um, and that was really inspired when I heard an interview with Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, who said that um, whenever he hears some music that at first he doesn't really like, he always makes himself go, who would do that? Like, who, who would write that kind of music and why would they do it? And he said, if you start off by asking those questions, then there's nothing that, is, that isn't interesting. And even for him as a musician, he can sort of get on board with it more than if he gets curious and empathizes with you know, whoever wrote the music. And, and that made me realize, oh, actually, I think curiosity um, shows up a lot of times as empathy as well. Mm. And so, so it comes out in all these different ways. And what we really want to help our teams to do is, first of all, recognize how curious they all are and how beneficial that can be. Um, and then find out ways that they can own their own curiosity. So we we'll often say, well, okay, so if you, you know, which of those faces feels most sort of natural to you and which one would you like to sort of turn up the volume on? And then what does that look like for you? What's sort of one question that maybe you think you need to ask, you know, in the next meeting? Um, mm. And and can we all make sure we're sort of bringing that to the table? I love the idea of having different faces of curiosity mm. so that you can identify yourself in one rather than mm. 
just having this sort of very vague concept of what it is or that kind yeah. of childlike, uh, you know, as you said, wonder and awe, that yeah. actually there are more specific ways of being curious that could be more natural to your style. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to talking about your PhD because yeah. you specialized in trust. Mm-hmm. Why did you decide to choose that topic? Yeah. So I was always, you know, I, I was sat in philosophy departments, but I was always really interested in the human side of philosophy. So, you know, there were really brilliant students uh, alongside me that were doing all this amazing work with, you know, logic and sort of um, probability theory and all these things that just sort of blew my mind. And I was like, wow, that's really amazing. But it didn't really let a fire in me. The things that I really loved were thinking about um, why people think the way they do. Where's that? come from. I think if I had maybe started studying anthropology first, maybe I would have become an anthropologist or something. I was really interested in the human side of ideas. Um, And then there was an opportunity to do some work on betrayal. Um, I was living in America, in Michigan, and there was this opening to do some research on the topic of betrayal uh, in Australia at Macquarie University. And um, I was lucky enough to to get the scholarship to go do that. And when I started reading about betrayal, all the arguments that were being made about it were using the concept of betrayal to define trust. Mm -hmm. So they were saying that any time that trust is sort of happening or whatever, um, you necessarily are vulnerable to betrayal. And and that, of course, links the two. So if you're going to get interested in uh, breaches of, of trust and betrayals and letdowns, then then you have to understand what trust is. And that sort of opened the door into that whole space. And it was it was just fascinating to me to think about um, what trust itself is, uh, how, how it operates in sort of one to one interactions, but also at the sort of organizational level. Um, you know, can you have too much trust? Is trust always good? Um, and also this was happening right around the, the sort of global financial crisis. And so there are a lot of questions around, well, how do we trust again? Um, where is trust showing up in our sort of social fabric? And um, and so right at that moment, that sort of happened when I was about a year and a half into the PhD. And suddenly there was a real sort of need for the kinds of things we were thinking about. Um, at the same time, I realized I didn't want to be an academic <laughs> forever. <laughs> and, um, and so I found myself in London um, because when I was in Australia, I met my wife, Karina, who's, who's from London. And so we back here. And um, I was just sort of thinking about how, you know, where is this useful? And and there was so many conversations going on around, well, we need to think well about trust and more importantly, trustworthiness. And so that that sort of started some of the work that I'm doing. And I said that where, where the trust stuff is probably still important is um, is that, that point around, you know, if we, if we don't f- feel safe, then we're not going to think our best. And so I'll still work a lot on trust and trustworthiness so that leaders can create the sort of climates where other people feel like, um, do you know what? I've, people have my back. I, I feel like I sort of am, I sort of kind of belong here and I'm mm. accepted here. And, and I, so I can sort of get on with the work rather than having to worry too much about self-protection and, and never quite getting very deeply into the work. So how can you create more trust? How can you create more trusting teams, environments? Like what, I mean, let's talk about it from a perspective of a leader. What what must they do? Yeah, good question. So in simple terms, I think it's um, noticing, well, communicating to others, to your team, that you see them and that you see what's important to them and that you care about that. Um, I think that's that's and it what works like how do you how do, how you, do you communicate do that, that? Like, what do you <laughs> <Yeah>. say <clears throat> so I think it's actually really importantly not what you say right sometimes it's what you say yes but more importantly it's what you do mm-hmm. and you know there was a there was probably about 10 years ago now there was an ad campaign that I saw on lots of you know as I was riding the train that said something it was for a financial institution that said something to the effect of you know trust us and there's <laughs> all this work coming out about the same time saying the last thing you should say when you want someone to trust you is, you know, trust me. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's kind of drawing your attention to the vulnerability. You know, if I say trust me, implicit in that is that you need to trust me or you're relying on me in some way and and that kind of makes you vulnerable. Um, So actually, it's not oftentimes about what we say, it's about what we do. And what we do is showing someone that, uh, that you and what you care about is important to me. And, the, you know, it makes sense. I mean, it's really, really simple, mm. but it, where it's hard is is because we're busy people with lots of competing uh, needs and, and things that we need to invest in. Um, but the reason that it makes sense that that would 
support trust and create the kind of climate is because if, you know, imagine that I'm a member of your team. If day in and day out, or maybe most of the days, because you don't have to be perfect to build trust, um, I feel like, well, do you know what? Maria really sort of gets me. I feel like mm-hmm. the other day I said I, you know, had a childcare issue or whatever, and and I felt like you really heard what I was saying. Um, maybe because of what you said in response to me, um, i.e., you know, uh, or e- e- G. Um, oh, Brennan, I, I understand you've got this issue. Let's see if we can move things around. But then the action of actually moving things around is the is the doing. Um, so that helps me know that you recognize my value probably to the team because you're willing to move things around to include me and, and make me feel valued. Um, and that is going to help me trust you because then next time that something really big is is at stake, or I feel like, gosh, I've made a mistake. Do I tell this to Maria or do I try to like brush it under the rug and hope she never sees? Uh, well, if I trust you, I'll tell you. And that's better for the all of us and better mm-hmm. for the work. Um, but I'm more likely to tell you because I know, oh, do you know what? Last time I sort of dropped the ball or couldn't do things. Um, you know, she seemed to appreciate me and value that. So I, I, I know Maria, I think she's going to sort of capture, which doesn't mean you can't be frustrated about my mistake or anything like that, but it just means there's that relational dynamic where, mm. I, where I feel supported. So uh, I love um, the work of Dr. John Gottman. I know we've talked about this before uh, in the past, but John Gottman is a psychology professor in Washington uh, State, US, and he talks a lot about building trust as um, in these moments where someone puts in what he calls a bid for your attention. They're sort of it's like they're passing a ball to you, like saying, uh, is it okay if I show up late for the meeting because I've got childcare issues or something? Or um, can we chat about something? Or maybe my tone just sort of changes in an email from being really flowery. Hi, Maria, how's it going to where's this thing go up to? You know, um, that's putting in a bid for your attention. If you um, if you turn towards me in those moments, rather than sort of pretending like you didn't hear it, didn't notice that bit of the email or whatever, um, then that's going to support trust. And he has 35 years of, of quantitative data of noticing, in his case, interpersonal sort of partnered relationships. So he has couples come and stay in this sort of lab where he observes the behavior and he can pick now which ones are going to stay together, and which ones are going to break, break up because he's noticing this behavior. And it's that noticing those moments where people are putting in a bid and then choosing to turn towards them. And so to your question, sorry, taking a sort of long way around to get to it, but to answer the kinds of behavior, uh, it isn't so much what we say, it's what we do. And it's, first of all, noticing, oh, this person, they're struggling a little bit or their body language has changed. Um, You know, if you ask me a question and I suddenly sort of shut down, move back, turn away from you a bit, rather than just pushing ahead with the deadline thing we're trying to discuss saying, should we take a few minutes? Should we take a little break? Um, you know, let's get some tea or why don't we finish the conversation, you know, walking because we know that moving side by side together is sort of better for, for coming together and collaborating. Um, you know, doing those sorts of things, showing that we're switched on to each other is, mm. is a really big, makes, makes a big difference. Yeah. The biggest thing I get is like actions speak louder than words mm. and the parenting is like, do you know teach by doing rather than like you know you can't say oh do as i say not as i do yes and it's the opposite of that completely so actions are definitely Mm. um the way to lead that but i love your example of the bids for attention because i think in today's world when we're again moving at a million miles an hour so outcome focused Mm. that we forget to actually pay attention to these things and i remember actually when we first met, which was at the School of Life, mm. and you were doing a course on communication. Mm. And at that point, I remember that I had issues myself in terms of like how I was communicating to other people. Because I mean, I don't know if you follow um, sort of the DISC behavioral um, no, assessment, yeah. mm. but um, like my communication style is very, very direct quite often at the times. And that doesn't really play out very well with individuals who really need that more kind of like empathetic Mm, I suppose um way of speaking and I just remember I was like oh took away so much from from that um and I think you're again one of the few people that I like and respect that make me want to be a better person (laughs) so like everything that you're saying here I think is um super helpful in the work that you do within uh businesses I think it's so Mm crucial to creating that psychological mm. safety that we kind of strive towards. Can I just pick up on something that you just yeah. mentioned? Because I, I think sometimes 
when we think about trust in particular, it, fe- it kind of feels like, oh, in order for me to build trust, I, we've all got to sort of fit this mold of the sort of really, uh, I don't know, not straight talking, um, sort of uh, super empathetic. And that might be true, but you can be empathetic and straight talking, right? And I think what we're talking about with with building trust is empathizing, noticing those those moments where someone's putting in a bit for your attention and then choosing to respond to them in a way which shows, I see you and I care about that. Mm. Um, and I think you can do that while being quite direct. And I think you can do that while saying no. You can do that while letting someone go, you know? Um, I was once gave a talk about uh, about building trust and someone came up to me at, at the end of the time and said, um, this is all making sense, but I kind of feel like if I'm going to build trust with my team, I've got to have no boundaries. I've got to sort of say yes to everything and be mm-hmm. sort of warm and cuddly all the time. And that's just not me. And it sounds exhausting. Um, and so I think it's really, we have to be careful to say, no, it's, it's, you can play to your strengths and you can be you and build trust where what that might look like if you're someone who speaks directly and isn't always the sort of um, touchy-feely sort of what you might think of as the sort of trustworthy leader is, um, is, well, taking the time to articulate that Mm -hmm. to your team and say, you know, there's a a new joiner, you know, we, we, um, uh, you know, this is, this is, you know, what would work really well for you about when we have a conversation, what's going to be really important for you? Do you, would you like, would you prefer it if we sort of get it all on the table and then work through it systematically? Or, um, would you, would it help you if we sort of just set an agenda through email first, you know, just to let you know, um, I, I really, uh, care about uh, that everyone on the team has their voice heard, but I also, uh, it's my natural sort of approach is to be quite direct. So I just want you to know if I'm direct, it's not personal. It's, it's, you know, these sorts of things that, that, you know, slightly going back to what I said about, it's not what you say, but sometimes it makes a difference Mm -hmm. because by saying that, it's not about the words necessarily, it's about the implicit move that I'm making. Move sounds a bit too sort of calculated and mm-hmm. gamey, but what I mean is the move that's being made there is to say, I care enough about you to explain how I am mm-hmm. <laughs> to you so that I can be myself and you can be yourself and that still goes a long way. To some to extent, it also gives permission to other people to do the same, yeah, yeah, right? So you're yeah. leading by example because you accepting that you mm. might be different to somebody else's approach and style and communication yeah. style. Yeah. Um, so that makes total sense. Cool. What do you think companies need to be focusing on now? Like what's the one thing that you mm. wish to see companies doing? Yeah. So I think curiosity is really central. Um, I'll come back to what that looks like when you say, you know, what do they need to be doing, right? Um, Because curiosity feels like, oh yeah, that sounds good, but it's kind of abstract. Um, But maybe before we get there, just to explain why I think that's the thing right now, goes back to some work that was done by um, a leadership expert named uh, Keith Grint that maybe we've talked about in the past as well. Um, Keith did this work with his team when he was at Warwick University, now he's at Oxford and, Basically, what he did was he tried to break down leadership into the types of challenges that we as leaders come up against. And he said there's three types of challenges, at least. There's um, critical problems, tame problems, and wicked problems. And he didn't coin that phrase, wicked problems. Um, It came out of the 1960s, 70s literature around sort of um, urban planning and things. But but he picked it up and has brought it right into the conversation a lot more. Um, And the reason that I think curiosity is is needed is because what Grint and his team found was that when you have a critical problem, which is sort of a really urgent thing, so funds are running out, we need to sort of inject some more money into whatever the business, that's really time sensitive. With those kinds of critical problems, um, he found that the best leaders, the kind of the con- what the context called for, going back to what I was saying about contextual leadership, what the context called for was an answer. Mm-hmm. We look to a leader just to say, everyone, do this because we've just got to put out these fires. Um, with a tame problem, that's not so urgent. It's more, okay, we've been here before. We need to hire someone. There's a challenge, but we need to get through with it. And he said the right way to lead in that way is to roll out a process that's been tried and tested. But a wicked problem is characterized not by urgency, though there might it might feel quite urgent. It's much more about uncertainty and complexity. So, um, you know, things around Brexit a few years ago and, and maybe, you know, currently as mm-hmm. well, um, feel really complex and uncertain. There's an urgency to it. How are we going to 
work out how we keep going forward, you know, whatever. Um, you know, COVID is another one of these kinds of wicked challenges. Um, not wicked because it's it's bad, though mm -hmm. it's brought a lot of difficulty, but wicked because of its uncertainty and complexity. Um, and if you have a leader who steps out and says, I've got a quick answer, or I've got a process that's been tried and tested a thousand times before, it falls flat because well, no one's been here before. No one's done sort of Brexit before. No one's done. I mean, we've had other issues globally, kind of like COVID, but not quite on the scale. So it's it's it feels in disingenuous to say an answer or a process. Um, what Grinch and his team found was whenever we have these kinds of wicked problems, we need to lead with questions. And that means curiosity. And the reason I so that's the, the reason that I say curiosity is where I think businesses and leaders and teams need to be going is because so much of our our world that the some of the things on our on our plates at the moment are characterized by uncertainty and complexity there's a lot of moving parts and so the first place to start is asking questions getting curious well what is the real nature of this am i assuming something about it that i shouldn't and so to come back to your question about well, what should businesses be doing I think we should be wherever possible, and I know this this might not feel very doable for a lot of people, but wherever possible, claw back a bit of time so that the meetings are not so rushed and we can make a bit of time to say, have we have we interrogated this as well as we need to before we move into execution phase? Or indeed, as we start to execute, can we build in some places for curiosity to check and be learning and, and prototype and those sorts of things? Um, also, you know, leading by example, you know, showing that we don't always have to have the answers, that we can, as leaders, ask questions that are really not just pre-rehearsed, that, you know, I have the answer, but I'm going to ask the question for your benefit. Real authentic questions where we don't really know, because those are the ones that draw others out and sort of, they feel authentic and people mm -hmm. go, gosh, they, um, you know, they're, they're confident enough to ask a question. Maybe I can ask mine too. Um, that what that's what I'd love to see businesses doing, you know, making time for curiosity. And this is this has been happening more over the last few years. You know, HBR Harvard Business Review published an article. This is going back like three or four years called "The Business Case for Curiosity." So it's it's been you know part of the conversation. But when we look at what businesses are doing, sort of you know nine to five or whatever the hours are these days, um, it's still we need to actually bring it in, and that means carving out time for questions, tar carving out time to to do you know think together about, well, what counts as a good question? How do we understand that? What do we build it in? And that's where, you know, we're, we're, we're doing sessions on just that sort of, how mm -hmm. do we think about questions? Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I'd love to see. Mm -hmm. more of. What I think the pandemic and Brexit and all of these things have, have shown is that how unpredictable life can be mm -hmm. and how uncertain a lot of what we're dealing with is because there's certain things that we just simply don't have control over. And mm -hmm. One of the key qualities that I look for is that ability to deal with uncertainty mm. in a leader because anything can happen at any point. And what you're saying is about sort of asking questions about staying flexible and curious that there isn't always yeah. the right answer for any particular yeah. problem because yeah. that problem may have not even existed. And I think that's really key. Mm. I want to touch on one of the things you said about meetings because I want to clarify okay. things before sure. people go ahead and start making even longer meetings yes. in, yes. in companies. Yeah. What I understand that you're saying is instead of necessarily prolonging the meetings, mm, it's more mm. about structuring them in a different yeah. way. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, more? <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So I'm not saying do we already doing, mm -hmm. but just tack on an extra, you know, uh, however, however long at the start or at the finish for a bit of curiosity, because the last thing that we want to do is have it, <clears throat> excuse me, feel like this box ticking exercise. Well, we've done our curiosity now on with the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, actually, no, it's, it's, building it in to to the conversation that we would have already been having so if it was, if it was going to be a 45 minute meeting keep it 45 minutes but build into the, you know one of your meetings when you're doing uh, you know a conversation about how we as a team are how we work how we exist have a conversation that is um when we talk about the details let's not just talk about the details mm -hmm. it's really important because of the climate we're working in that we're checking things so it's still 45 minutes but it might be saying um you know if you feel like you're a group of people where you feel comfortable to that everyone's going to bring up questions as they have them great but if you don't quite trust yourselves enough to do that then maybe you say hey in this 45 minutes we're going to have a rotating sort of um rotor of one person at a time it's it's your job this this week to sort of ask a question or make sure that we're asking questions you know mm. um sort of be the philosopher in the room that, mm. that that does some of that and 
it doesn't have to take more time. Um, you know, thinking well. Um, I mean, I'm an advocate for for taking the time that you need to think. But if we if we're saying you know for this to work for us, Brendan, we can't we can't take more time. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it has to take more time. We can think. Um, you can think one thought just as quickly as you can think another thought, and you can you can say, okay. Um, I mean, how often are we in a meeting and, and we notice? an opportunity, something going by and go, oh, I'm not quite sure that we've thought that through all the way. <laughs> I'm just going to let that go mm-hmm. because it feels too messy or, do you know, what? I know that we've only got two minutes left. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it is the sort of two minute situation, then maybe you don't bring it up then, but you circle back, you know, in Slack or whatever to, to make sure that that gets picked up because it is really important. Um, and that's another thing that I think part of our conversation is suggesting that the, the questions are really important. The thinking is just as important as the doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that sort of, um, I don't know, my, my mind goes back to like the classic Benjamin Franklin quotes that my dad used to tell me, like a, a stitch in time saves nine, um, where, you know, if you get the thinking right, mm-hmm. the execution is so much more easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, you know, yeah, you can bake it in. Don't have longer meetings, but... I wonder if we were to listen back to this podcast and see how many times I use the word doing or ask you a question about that Mm. and the number of times you say thinking, I'd be curious to see. Actually, I'm going to do that and see how how that stacks up because, you know, you're really advocating the idea of it's the thought. I mean, for sure, Mm. you need to get things done, but actually spending... Not necessarily, not necessarily more time, but factoring that time in whatever the mm-hmm. time that you've got mm-hmm. to do deliberate thinking about yeah. specific problems yeah. and, and issues and to kind of stop yourself and, you know, kind of pause, take stock before you kind of, mm. you know, start running off in a, in a certain direction yeah. that may not necessarily be the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you say about being, be the philosopher in the room. Mm. I think that's very, it's almost like a nice tagline to have on your like post-it note on your computer yeah. to kind of encourage you to think in a glamorous way mm. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, you can pause, ask questions and kind of be curious and maybe don't necessarily take everything as, what you immediately assume it to be. So kind of challenge those assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And on that note, who is the best thinker in history, in your opinion? (laughs) Gosh, that is is difficult. Um, I'm I'm gonna avoid saying someone that we think of as a philosopher Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't want us to think that to be a good thinker, we've got to fit a mold of, mm-hmm. you know, coffee, cigarettes, and black roll top jumpers, or you know, mm-hmm. or some, something like that. I, I mean, I could say my one of my favorite philosophers of all time is Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish existentialist, or we could, you know, I think he's a great thinker of all time, Simone de Beauvoir, you know. But actually, I think part of what we've been saying about talking about is um, being the philosopher in the room, and so I would, I want to say the 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 best thinker. Uh, I'm gonna cut off the of all time because I wanna I wanna open it up to more than one person. Um, is the person who is in the least position of power, but still um, asks their question mm-hmm. and challenges because that it's 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 hard for leaders with the power they have to think really well because there's a lot of pressure there too. But I think if you've got someone who things are stacked against them, but they still put their hand up and say, do you know what? I don't think we've we've considered this. And if they can do that in a way which is not, doesn't feel like they're criticizing the, the other people mm-hmm. or are saying, I know what's right, not you, but are rather going, I think we're missing a trick. Mm-hmm. That's a brilliant thinker because they've noticed something. They've had the courage to bring it up when maybe they're not the um, the person that everyone's looking to for the answer. Um, and they've managed to articulate it in a way which, um, you know, just pushes all the office politics to the side and is clearly sort of uh, doing that thinking partner work. Mm-hmm. So that, the, you know, and all of us can do that. Um, all of us can do that, and the and, and those those are the the best thinkers of all time. I think probably when you have when you look at historical philosopher philosoph- philosophical figures, people like Simone de Beauvoir and Kierkegaard and stuff. Um, actually, probably the ones that come to mind 
are some of those people. You know, Kierkegaard at his time in, in Denmark was, was hated. His first name was Soren, and apparently in the culture at the time, parents, when their children were misbehaving, would say, don't be a Soren, you know. Um, and so he was he was sort of the underdog, mm -hmm. not expected to have the power. You know, yes, he was a wealthy sort of person, but so he had a lot of different sorts of power. But he wasn't the one expected to have, have the answer. And yet he still sort of came up, came up with these views. Mm. Um, Simone de Beauvoir writing The Second Sex, again, you know, all kinds of issues around uh, gender and class and everything going on there. Again, not, a, not probably uh, a, as, as sort of um, the person expected all the time and still not talked about as much as, mm -hmm. you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, who they were famously in a relationship. How much more do we hear Sartre's name than mm -hmm. de Beauvoir, right? So, so I love the philosophers this historical the philosophers that that come out of that place and sort of despite the difficulty put their hands up and go actually i think we need to think about this um and i think we can all do that well on that note <laughs> thank you so cool. much brennan pleasure. pleasure to have you and uh yeah thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here on anatomy of a leader i hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made, and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO, or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.